welcome to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the library entry section of the ACCP community's website. So today I'll be covering a journal club on the inhaled amikacin to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia. Before we get started about talking about this journal, I wanted to kind of cover some of the background information that will kind of put us all on the same page. And so uh, with uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia, essentially a patient gets intubated with the endotracheal tube and within our uh, mouth, we have oral microorganisms that can essentially get stuck into the endotracheal tube. And this can uh, cause the organisms to form biofilms and essentially grow uh, within the endotracheal tube and cause respiratory tract infection. Additionally, um, when you look at a patient who gets intubated, there are usually cuffs at the more distal end of the endotracheal tube. And when this cuff is inflated, it causes secretions to kind of build up uh, within this portion of the endotracheal tube. And so a lot of like secretions as well as uh, microorganisms that can appear there. And although the cuff is supposed to prevent uh, air leakage uh, from going through and other uh, materials from going through, there are micropores within these cuffs that allow for uh, the secretion and microorganisms to kind of pass uh, through the cuffs and ultimately can lead to aspiration pneumonia. Additionally, uh, with the inflation of the cuff, you can get damage to your endo, uh, endothelial uh, lining, uh, your respiratory tract. Uh, and so this can result in uh, impairment of your uh, immune response, um, as well as uh, need for um, areas where you can become infected. And so how exactly is a ventilator-associated pneumonia diagnosed? Um, it's typically diagnosed through a combination of clinical assessment as well as your culture. So typically the cultures will be done through either a sputum culture or a uh, bronchial uh, alveolar uh, lavage. And so uh, with the, if the organism appears on the culture uh, and the patient has worsening respiratory uh, symptoms, uh, typically this would be suspicious and uh, diagnostic for a ventilator-associated pneumonia. There are some uh, diagnostic threshold to kind of consider, uh, such as like um, if a patient had a protective specimen brush uh, type of sampling, then this the threshold for the diagnosis would be like greater than or equal to 10 to the third colony forming units. Whereas if they did a BAL for the, uh, to obtain the culture, then that's when it would be uh, 10 greater than or equal to 10 to the fourth uh, colony forming units on the culture itself. Uh, before uh, you would establish the diagnosis. And then there, there's uh, this concept of the use of procalcitonin. Uh, procalcitonin isn't really recommended to be used as a way to initiate your therapy. Um, and so uh, that's just something to kind of keep in mind as some providers may choose to uh, get a procalcitonin initially, although this wouldn't be a diagnostic criteria for someone with ventilator-associated pneumonia. Just quickly overview of like some of the treatments that are available for ventilator-associated pneumonia. What I really want to highlight here isn't really all the things that you see on the slide, but from many, uh, most of the agents that are listed here, what we're really covering for for ventilator-associated pneumonia is like your Staphylococcus aureus type of infection, your Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa, or your gram-negative uh, bacilli uh, types of infection. And from the agents that are listed here, they're typically more broader and they'll be able to cover all of these organisms. There are specific criteria of when you would consider covering for possible MRSA, such as like if a patient has a higher risk of um, antimicrobial uh, resistance or if they're in a unit um, that is 10 to 20 percent. Uh, of MRSA infection prevalence, or if we just don't know the exact prevalence of MRSA within the unit, then that's when we would consider uh, using our coverage like vancomycin for MRSA. But overall, uh, there are also criteria of when you would want to cover, like double cover for, uh, possibly double cover for pseudomonas. So this would be things like 
if a patient uh, has risk factor for antimicrobial resistance or they're in a unit greater than 10% of gram negative isolates that are resistant to the pseudomonas and uh, patients uh, who are in the ICU uh, who do not have any local susceptibility uh, results. And so just kind of quickly cover some of the guideline recommendations. So what we see here is essentially um, we want to generally cover for our Staphylococcus aureus, our pseudomonas, as well as some of our gram-negative organisms. The MRSA criteria uh, for coverage are listed there. I kind of talked about them a little bit earlier. What I wanted to highlight about these recommendations is that essentially within the guidelines, you don't see any recommendations for use of prophylactic antibiotic for a ventilator associated pneumonia or to uh, essentially prevent it. However, they did talk a little bit about the use of like inhaled uh, aminoglycoside. And the only time they really mentioned it is to be used as an adjunctive therapy in combination with your systemic antibiotics to be able to treat a gram-negative uh, bacilli infection. Additionally, they generally recommend to avoid aminoglycosides if possible um, and to use other agents if the gram-negative uh, organism is susceptible to it. So um, I wanted to kind of cover some of the prior literatures uh, that we see in regards to uh, using antibiotic as prevention for ventilator-associated pneumonia. So there is a study by uh, Kalesterski. Um, and this uh, was a randomized double-blinded trial uh, comparing gentamicin uh, against your uh, saline. Um, and they essentially administered both these drugs endotracheal endotracheally uh, three times a day. And it was done in our neurosurgical ICU patient population who uh, underwent tracheostomy. They excluded any patient who died or would discharge within 40 hours of admission. And um, the results of this trial was that um, they saw a lower rate of uh, positive sputum cultures in the gentamicin group compared to your uh, normal saline group at about 56.5% prevalence compared to 79.3% prevalence uh, in comparison to the saline group. However, we did not see any difference in terms of the mortality or uh, the adverse effects of the treatment. Some things to know about this is that out of all the positive uh, culture, gentamicin did have higher rates of uh, pseudomonas uh, as well as Providencia species growing, uh, while in the placebo group, they had higher rates of Klebsiella and Proteus organisms. No sensitivities uh, results were reported for this uh, trial, uh, but an analysis of uh, susceptibility of gram-negative organism in both groups showed no statistical significant difference. So overall, what we can conclude from this is that uh, gentamicin reduced the colonization of tracheal secretion by gram-negative uh, rods, and it reduces the frequency of respiratory infection. However, it doesn't seem to have any mortality benefit. So in another study by uh, Calvinier, um, this uh, study essentially looked at uh, patients age 18 years or older who were mechanically ventilated for about 40 hours. Um, this was a randomized, uh, single-centered, uh, two-arm open-label controlled trial that compared colistin uh, to your uh, your NS, and essentially uh, they dosed uh, the colistin through nebulization uh, for three times a day, and um, they did the same thing with your NS solution. Um, the 2.5 mLs uh, were pretty much the same um, after the uh, solutions were prepared for the colistin as well. Uh, they set it for a duration of 10 days or until the patient got extubated. Um, so when we look at the results of this trial, we essentially see that uh, patients who received the colistin had a lower rate of VAPT. However, this was not statistically uh, significant. Neither was the mortality um, or the MDR rate. And there was also no difference in terms of the one side effect that was reported, which was the bronchospasm. And so uh, based on... Um, so some things to uh, note about this trial, though, was that um, the baseline characteristic for the patient was noted that about 70 to 80 percent of the patient had received systemic antibiotic covering uh, gram-negative bacteria during the 10-day period of the prophylaxis. And uh, patients in both groups had an Apache score of around of uh, 19, which indicated about 24 percent mortality. And infection on uh, admission was noted to be higher in the uh, normal saline group compared to the colistin group even though this was not statistically uh, significantly different. 
Um, so overall, when we look at this trial, uh, we can conclude that prophylaxis uh, nebulization of colistin uh, does not reduce uh, VAP incidence. The last trial that uh, was done previous to our trial was uh, a trial by Wood. And essentially, this was a prospective randomized double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial that compared ceftazidine to your normal saline. Um, and it looked at uh, ceftazidine 250 milligram nebulization every 12 hours in comparison to our placebo of NS uh, nebulization every 12 hours for a duration of up to uh, seven days. And so they looked at this in patients who were 16 years or older uh, in our trauma ICU on a mechanical ventilator for greater than or equal to seven days with a known risk factor for post-traumatic uh, pneumonia. And essentially, um, what we see from uh, this trial was that patient uh, who received ceftazidine um, had a significantly lower um, VAP occurrence during the ICU stay compared to patients who only received uh, the normal saline. But no significant difference was noted in the mortality or adverse effects uh, that was seen. The, the unique thing about this trial also was that, um, although I didn't include it in the endpoints here because I always wanted to include things that we were looking across uh, all three studies, was that they did see an increase in pro-inflammatory markers um, that were elevated from their baseline when given ceftazidine. So uh, overall, the patients in this trial were generally more severe patients with an Apache 2 score around 20 to 22 in both groups, indicating about 40% mortality. And systemic uh, antibiotic exposure prior to your study was not statistically uh, significantly different between the two groups. Uh, so what we conclude from this study was essentially that cetazidine uh, decreased the frequency of ventilator-associated pneumonia in critically ill trauma patients without increasing the resistance, but it can increase the pro, uh, pro-inflammatory response in the lungs. So kind of um, putting all of this together, everything that we talked about, uh, why exactly did we do the study on the use of amikacin uh, for inhalation uh, or amikacin inhalation for prevention of ventilator-associated pneumonia? Well, when we look at the um, statistics surrounding uh, ventilator social pneumonia, there's about 5 to 40% chance of critically ill patients developing ventilator social pneumonia, pneumonia when they're intubated, and about 13% mortality for patients who have ventilator social pneumonia. And uh, based on some of the previous studies that we uh, talked about, it seems like there might be some benefit in using uh, prophylactic uh, antimicrobial inhalation solution uh, to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia. And um, ventilator-associated pneumonia has been shown to increase antibiotic consumption, as well as duration of mechanical ventilation, ICU length of stay, and hospital costs, all of which can be prevented if we're able to prevent or uh, be decreased if we were able to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia. The hypothesis for this study was essentially um, a three-day course of inhaled uh, amikacin uh, initiated after the third day of invasive mechanical ventilation might reduce the incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Um, This was done uh, with the funding from the uh, French government through the French Ministry of Health. And so when we look at the um, inclusion and exclusion criteria, we see that they included patients um, who were on mechanical ventilation for greater than or equal to 72 hours and they excluded any patients who were initially uh, on a mechanical ventilator for greater than 96 hours uh, with a suspected or confirmed ventilator associated pneumonia, severe AKI without renal replacement therapy, uh, CKD, tracheostomy tube, and uh, receiving systemic aminoglycoside uh, therapy. They were able to uh, get this approved by the National Ethic Committees in uh, France. And so um, a little bit closer look in terms of the exclusion criteria. Uh, what we see is that most of our patients who were excluded were patients who were intubated for less than 72 hours at the initiation of the trial, um, those who did not provide consent, um, those who were on uh, invasive, invasive mechanical ventilation for greater than 96 hours, and uh, those who had an exhibition that was uh, uh, going to be scheduled. And so after looking over about 6,419 eligible individuals, they eventually included about 417 individuals within the amicacin group and 430 individuals within the placebo group. Within the amicacin group, they gave those individuals 20 milligrams per kilogram ideal body weight or um, uh, NS nebulization solution uh, once daily for about three consecutive days. And the patients who were uh, not 
um, not given their second or third dose of the amikacin either met one of the following criteria, including if they were exhibited, they had an occurrence of AKI, or if the physician determined that the immunoglycoside therapy uh, IV was indicated for the patient. Additionally, something else to know about this trial was that uh, the vent setting as well as sedation, muscle, relax muscle relaxations were all at the discretion of the physician. And so uh, that could have uh, influenced some of the outcomes of our trial. Um, the primary outcome was uh, generally the first episode of ventilator associated pneumonia from randomization to day 28. And uh, the episode of ventilator associated pneumonia was defined as a positive quantitative uh, bacterial cultures in a pulmonary sample and at least two of the following criteria, including hyperleukocytosis, leukopenia, fever, or purulent secretion with uh, new infiltrates on the chest uh, radiography. They had a ton of uh, secondary outcomes, but some of them would include things like mortality at 28 days uh, and uh, day 90, uh, numbers of days of mechanical uh, ventilation from randomization to day 28, uh, numbers of antibiotic days, um, as well as number uh, of days with administration to of at least one systemic antibiotic. And so um, when we look at the statistical analysis, uh, this was a randomized superiority trial. They estimated about 850 individuals were needed to provide 80% power with a two-sided alpha of 0 0.05. Uh, the analysis was based on an intention, intention to treat uh, principle, and they did a between-group analysis of restricted mean survival time to ventilator associated pneumonia. Um, and uh, their total group population, uh, the hazardous uh, ratio was calculated using the fine and gray uh, regression model. And so when we look at the results of this trial, we see uh, the baseline characteristics were essentially similar across uh, the two groups. Uh, what we did notice from this was that generally based on the Charleston uh, comorbidity index score, as well as the simplified acute physiology score and the uh, sequential organ failure assessment score, um, the patients that were included in this trial, this trial was generally uh, more severe patients. Uh, the mortality rates can, re uh, uh, the predicted mortality rate was ranging anywhere from like 33 to 49%. Uh, uh, and the infections were about a 30 to 33% across both uh, of the groups. And um, most of the patients that were in this trial had systemic antibiotic therapies uh, with uh, about a 78, uh, 77 to 78% of the individuals within both of the groups having used some kind of systemic antibiotic therapies uh, at baseline. Um, they also had a median of about uh, 3.5 days um, uh, before initiation on this clinical trial. And so um, when we look at the outcomes of this trial, we see that um, they showed that amication had a lower rates of first episode of ventilator-associated pneumonia at about 15% compared to 22% in the placebo group. And they also had significantly um, uh, lower uh, infection-related ventilator-associated complication as well. Uh, uh, they were significant for the AKI occurrence in which they had uh, actually lower AKI occurrence uh, than the placebo. Um, there was no difference seen in the time to the first uh, successful uh, SBT trial um, and hospital death as well as ESBL and Pterobacter teralis. I think the thing to kind of know about this was uh, when we saw the rate of AKI being lower in the uh, amicacin group, it was a little bit weird to me. Um, and so when we look at some of the baseline data for uh, this trial, we see that uh, when they excluded patients with CKD, they really only excluded patients who had a GFR of less than 30, um, whereas anyone who were greater than 30, including those uh, who were 30 to 60, uh, which would still be our CKD patients, um, were um, included within this trial. And we did see um, that the placebo group did have more elevated uh, patients with um, uh, serum creatinine, and so this could be a possible explanation. The other thing is that um, uh, that patients uh, in the placebo group all, could have also had more uh, shocks, uh, which could have decreased perfusion to the AKI to the kidney and result in more AKI episodes. However, um, this result wasn't reported, and so it was just more of a speculation in terms of why this could have been a possibility.
Overall, um, when they were classifying uh, uh, infection-related ventilator social complications, uh, they essentially defined this as worsening oxygen associated uh, with signs of infection and initiation of antibiotic um, therapy. And so uh, that's just something to note as we look at some of the graphs that was provided to us, um, including uh, what well, the first graph is essentially um, a look at the uh, difference between inhaled amikacin and our placebo for the incidence of VAP. And we see that there is um, a gap uh, that's notable uh, in between the treatment group, and this was statistically significantly different. Um, the bottom graph here is just really um, a zoomed out version of the top graph. And so this is just kind of to help with um, our visualization of it. Um, they also did talk about ventilator associated complication, um, which was essentially defined as worsening of oxygen over two days after a stable or improved period. And so we did see that our amicacin group did have lower cases of ventilator or ventilator associated complications. Uh, when we look at the infection related ventilator associated complications, so this is essentially um, our uh, worsening oxygen nation uh, in combination with signs of infection. Um, an initiation of a antibiotic therapy. And we did see uh, a lower rate of that in our inhaled amicacin compared to the placebo. Um, and then when we look at the possible ventilator associated pneumonia, um, we did see a lower rate in our amicacin group as well. And so uh, what were some of the uh, things that uh, were done well and uh, that could have been improved in terms of this trial? Um, so some of the things that were done well was essentially the baseline characteristics were similar uh, between both groups, which means that the two groups being compared were similar to each other. So less, so there's less concern of group differences uh, influencing the result. Uh, most patients included were in a severe condition, so uh, we can apply this to a more higher risk patient population. Uh, the use of normal saline nebulization helped to maintain the blinding between the group and reduce bias. Um, the author also did uh, a good job in terms of mentioning that um, they did not uh, get amicacin level because they did not want the people who were involved to know uh, which individual received uh, which treatment. Um, and so this kind of helps to maintain the blinding of the trial. Um, and at the same time, uh, the problem with this was that we didn't have levels that were obtained. And so this kind of prevented us from correlating if the patient uh, received appropriate uh, exposure to the amicacin group. Additionally, um, some of the cons uh, from this trial is that um, it had high baseline percentage of individuals who were on systemic antibiotic. So this could have influenced our primary outcome um, as uh, organisms may not have grown due to the use of uh, systemic antibiotic. Uh, physicians also got to decide whether or not the patient should be on systemic antibiotic, um, which would decide if they should receive the second or third dose of amicacin or placebo. And so this kind of um, added a little bit more bias towards uh, our trial as um, this was something that wasn't standardized or protocolized. And so we don't really know um, what exactly the effects of this drug might have been if the patient received the whole three course, uh, some of our patients did only receive one or two doses. Um, datas uh, can also be interpreted up to only 28 days, uh, given that the trial was um, up to 28 days and we were uncertain of the prophylactic effects uh, beyond the 28 days. Additionally, um, they did exclude patients who uh, were on mechanical ventilation for greater than 96 days. Um, so we don't really know if it would be beneficial for patients who've been on mechanical ventilator um, for a lot longer to be able to start this prophylactic treatment uh, regimen. Um, they did also they also didn't mention what type of organisms ended up growing or causing the ventilator associated uh, episode, and so the lack of cultural data makes it more difficult to kind of analyze whether or not we should be implementing the use of uh, amikacin for uh, preventing prevention of uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. Uh, additionally, there wasn't any standardization for a ventilator setting. Uh, this was adjusted based on the physician's judgment, 
which could uh, affect the overall uh, mortality outcome for the patient. And if we were to kind of apply or try to apply the study to our own patient population in terms of them being on a mechanical ventilator, it would be difficult to kind of mimic what was done within this trial as we don't know exactly what was done in terms of the mechanical ventilation setting. Uh, just some other things to note was that the nebulization solution was, or how it was administered wasn't really mentioned. And so there's also that uh, factor of unknown when it comes to the administration of the drug. Um, they also didn't talk about anything about maintaining of the equipment uh, that could affect the drug delivery. And due to the lack of the drug level, it's difficult to say if the patient got adequate uh, doses of the drug. There is a liposomal formulation of the amikacin inhalation that was approved in 2018 by the U.S. Uh, FDA. Um, however, that was only a, uh, approved for the uh, for use in um, our MAC uh, types of infections, and so uh, and it was only mainly for treatment. So we don't really have a specific dose um, in terms of what we should be dosing patients for prophylactic use of amikacin. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, ambiguity to kind of think about and consider when interpreting the data for this trial. Um, so what did the author essentially conclude from this trial? They essentially concluded amongst patients who receive invasive mechanical ventilation for at least three days, a subsequent three-day course of preventive inhalation of amicacin reduced the burden of uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia during the 28 days of follow-up. Uh, my conclusion to this study was that the data uh, showed a lower rate of VAP from inhaled amicacin but the higher rates of antibiotic use at baseline and the lack of cultural uh, data uh, prevents a definitive conclusion to be drawn from the study. Inclusion of CKD uh, patients at baseline is concerning to validate the results of, uh, showing that amicacin had lower rates of AKI and the dosing of amicacin prophylactically is not established and the lack of data on serum drug concentration makes it difficult to include that the patient receive appropriate and consistent dose of the drug. And so how can we apply this trial to possibly some of our future practices? Um, I think one way to kind of consider the use of this trial is that patients at higher risk of gram-negative infection, including those who have a history of gram-negative infection, recent hospital visit, um, units uh, in which they're hospitalized have greater than 10% gram-negative isolate or they have high risk of mortality, then the use of prophylactic um, amicacin inhalation might be appropriate. In addition, we should also make sure that the patient's on mechanical ventilator uh, between the uh, three to four days um, before uh, considering the use of this. Um, however, there still, I think, needs to be further trials, such as uh, trials that compare uh, additional things like your gentamicin or other uh, inhalation uh, solutions that were uh, compared in previous trials to really kind of um, assess the efficacy of amicacin as well as uh, being able to get uh, some of the information that were missing from this trial that we mentioned earlier. I wanted to acknowledge uh, some of the individuals who helped me with this presentation, including um, Dr. Maldonado, as well as Dr. Santibanes, uh, for their help in uh, reviewing and putting this presentation together. These are the list of my references that I used, and I would be happy to take any questions that anyone has. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only. It does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest, and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.